We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. I still have a dream. There are many sources of energy available. Everything is energy. My God, do we need this a lot. Free our minds. Corporations have taken over the world. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. Hello, you're very welcome once again to the Irish side of the moon. This is Michael and this is interview number 78. You're very, very welcome as ever. Uh, Previously, we spoke with Mark Jacobson and the topic was a plan to power 100% of the planet with renewables. Uh, That was our previous interview and that is available from our own irishsideofthemoon.blogspot.com and iTunes, etc., etc. This week, this show, uh, speaking with Lloyd Pye. Lloyd Pye is an author and researcher, widely known for his work with the Star Child Skull, and for his best-selling non-fiction book, Everything You Know Is Wrong. To find out more about the topic of this week's interview, uh, if it's all new to you, and indeed even if it's not, uh, Star Child Project dot com star child project no spaces no nothing just all one long word star child project dot com and you'll be able to see uh, everything uh, I'm looking at it right now you've got the star child skull basics DNA reports studies illness deformity books and ebooks Wikipedia is wrong uh, we'll be talking about that during the show so yes this is show number seventy eight of Irish Side of the Moon and as I say you're very very welcome. And I'm now on the line with Lloyd Pye. Uh, it's a pleasure to speak to you today. Lloyd, how are you? I'm fine, Michael, and thank you for calling and going You're through all the hassles it takes to do an inter- <laughs> international uh, interview like this. I appreciate yeah. it very much. No, it's a pleasure to have you on the Irish Side of the Moon. I'm really looking forward to this. And uh, the hassles is all part of the, the fun and games. And, of course, technology has given us such a small world it's very easy really to reach out to you on one side of the world uh different time zones different different weather different climates whatever uh it's still very very possible uh lloyd we're going to jump uh before we jump i suppose into the the nuts and bolts of uh the 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 actual messages and the content that you have for us here on the show today uh we always like to delve a little bit into the background of our guests a little bit uh start off with kind of a little bit of a a primer on who we're actually speaking to turn the clock back to before you got involved in this and even before you got involved in some of your other work which i I want to talk about as well i'm very interested in some of the things you've you've worked on pre Mm -hmm. uh 1999 Uh, go back to your youth what sort of things were interesting you as a teenager were you a guy who was were you studious were you reading comic books uh, did you have flights of fancy? Like, wh- what was lighting your fire? Who were you back in your formative years? I, I was strictly, uh, as a young man, I, ha- I have to be honest, I was strictly into just girls and sports, like most young men <laughs> my age. I mean, that was it, really. Uh, I, I, I was okay. I was smart, smart enough in school. I made good grades and all that. But I wasn't slanted toward academics. I was very much slanted toward a- athletics. I, I played the American games of baseball, American football, track and field. I liked that very much. Uh, I wasn't good in basketball. It was the only one that I didn't do. Um, and then as I, as I got older, I played football. I, got a, I was good enough to get a football scholarship in college, to play in college. I didn't grow right? big. Thinking, am I right in thinking you wrote about this? Didn't you write a fiction? You wrote a novel? I did. I wrote a, I yeah. wrote a, a novel yeah. about my experiences yep. playing college football, and it's a, it's a very good book for anybody that uh, that is interested in that sort of thing. I don't know that there would be that many in, in Ireland, but it's called A Darker Shade of Red, and it's uh, why, you know, considered by those that played the game to be as, you know, as good as there is about it. Excellent, and that's available from all the usual, from Amazon and various websites. So yeah, am, just Amazon, yeah, just Amazon, okay. not, not okay. necessarily in bookstores, but Amazon for sure. Okay, okay. and there's another one as well, I know, um, uh, more of a thriller piece as well. We'll I suppose we'll get to those in time. So as a kid or as a teenager, it was the sport, it was, as you said, the girls, all the sort of things that right. lights most of our fires. And 
as you moved out of your teens, as you moved, what changes? What what lit fires that? I, I can tell happened? you exactly. I, I read a, I read a book as a senior in college. That my senior year of college was 1968, and in 1967 was the filming of the Patterson Gimlin film, and it was also the later. Uh, exposure of the Minnesota Iceman, two, two uh, subjects relative to hominoids, the large hair-covered creatures that, that live around the world. Well, at that time, nobody knew, we knew very little about it, and I stumbled across a, across a book in our um, university library called, that had been published in 61 or 62. It was called Abominable Snowmen, Legend Come to Life by Ivan Sanderson, and that just riveted me. I mean, absolutely, it's still one of the best books, I think, published in that field, the whole field of, of hominology. And that was, again, it's a, it's a 50-year-old book now, but it's still extremely well documented by a man, who Ivan Sanderson, who was a, a trained botanist, biologist, uh, who really knew his stuff. And so it's an it's extremely well-done book. I was hooked. I mean, I was absolutely hooked on the subject, but there wasn't that stage, much information available. Yeah, you're already just taking a little sidestep from the mainstream accepted scientific route when you start looking right. at this, of course. So you're already kind of tipping your, dipping your right. toe right. outside the norm. In the water. That's exactly right. I, so I started, and once I began to, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a, a flow, and it works the same way for everybody. You come out of school thoroughly brainwashed. I mean, that's the pu purpose of school, is to brainwash you into believing what the mainstream wants you to believe. And then if you find out one thing, just one thing is all it takes is wrong, really wrong, you start looking for other things. Well, that's what happened with me. I found that this one thing about hominoids that we had been told that such a thing couldn't exist, da -da -da -da, that we had evolved from, from uh, apes, from higher primates, all of that. I, I, as I began to research, I began to realize, wait a minute, that whole story is just wrong. And so I, as I began to do that, I then was open to the idea that other things were wrong as well. And, and most people that move into alternative knowledge, that's how it happens. They'll have some experience, some seminal experience like I had reading that book, or they'll see a Bigfoot, or they'll see a UFO, or they'll, do, or, or they'll have a friend that something will happen. Something will happen to open their mind to the possibility that everything they've been told is not necessarily the truth. Now, there's also millions out there who thoroughly believe the brainwashing that they get, and, and those are your conservatives or your mainstream people or however you want to describe them but there are those of us who step off the path and never go back because we know that the the path we were told was not the correct one yeah well you're hitting on two themes that come up time and time again with our guests with people like yourself who have written books people who have given lectures or made movies or whatever the idea that a lot of the schooling and we've we've focused on this before is brainwashing you said that and again the other theme that recurs is the idea that the people we speak to, and I think the people that are listening and responding to us, um, uh, responding to the shows and to our guests, are the people who are willing to open their minds and consider, okay, this could be, this alternative could actually be what's the real deal. So in your own case, suddenly you were dipping, you were interested, you were looking at... And, uh, Give us a broad overview in terms of all these, these creatures that, the, the, that have been seen, the sightings, do they, you know, geographically, are they all over the place? Um, and in terms of the scientific findings, the stuff that if you dig, I'm sure there are things in labs that, that can back up some of this stuff. So there's two kind of questions. Geographically, where does all this happen? And then scientifically... Well, the yeah, the hominoids, the hominoids, Michael, live on every continent except Antarctica. And when I say hominoids, I'm talking about four different large groups of them. There are the giant kind, the Sasquatch Bigfoot kind, 8 to 10 feet tall, 800 to 1,000 pounds, the really big ones. Then you have two types of man-sized. You have the abominable snowman, yeti kind, and when I say man-sized, it's 5 to 7 feet tall and, you know, 500 to 700 pounds, and they live exclusively in the, in the range of the Himalayas, which is six mountain ranges altogether, and it's a, almost as big as the United States. It's a big territory that the Yetis live in, uh, the abominable snowmen, but they do not seem to have traveled to other parts of the world. They don't have feet that are built well for, for 
walking on anything other than like ver not like angled like the mountains. You know, they don't have good flat land walking feet. It doesn't look like based on the footprint analysis that we have of them. Then you have another kind, the almas, um, captors kind. They are man sized as well, five to to six, uh, five to seven feet tall, same same basic size, but they are more sophisticated physically than are the Yetis. They are more like the the Bigfoot Sasquatch kind, but on a smaller scale. And then you have the pygmy kind, the Almas, the Sadapos, that live in jungles around the equators that, that I mean, around the equator, the jungles that wrap around the equator of the Earth. And those are in the range of four feet tall and around two to three hundred pounds. And they that that's your four main categories. But they live in various niches, um, ec ecological niches where they can survive and dominate and where we don't go. Now, we think one of the biggest uh, misconceptions that humans have is that we think we live absolutely everywhere, and if we don't live there, we've explored it. As much as half, literally as much as half of the arable land of this planet, half of it, and arable means take out the water, take out the ice caps, take out the deserts. Arable means things can grow on it. Of the all the land where things can grow, 50% of it has probably never had any kind of absolute, you know, uh, examining it on the ground, boots on the ground, people looking at it, surveyors. It hasn't been surveyed. Yeah, I know, it's, a, it's an astounding fact, but it's true. What we do is we'll go in a place that's trackless forest, just deep, dense forest or, or anything like that, and we'll cut a road through it, maybe, where we can get from one side to the other. But we don't, we don't live in places where it's just so thick you can't really move easily. That's where the hominoids live. They live in these these dense, dense forests, these montane forests, and anywhere you have forests, swamps, jungles, they're there. I, I'm from Louisiana. We've got them in the swamps there. I now live in Florida. We have them in the swamps here. They're called the swamp apes or the, the skunk apes. Um, they have recordings of hominoid sightings in every state in the United States, except Hawaii, and even then we're not sure. But they certainly have them in every other one. Uh, and that brings um, me to my, next, to, my, to my next question. This particular field of study, the hominide, like as, as it was at the beginning when you got interested in stuff, what is it? Is it, con, is it constructed of, of eyewitness accounts primarily? Is it conducted from, from tracking? It, like, what does the actual field of study entail? Well, that's it. It, it, it lots and lots and lots of sightings a lot of very good track evidence. And then you have, of course, the the wonderful Patterson-Gimlin film, regardless of what you hear about that, the Patterson-Gimlin film is real. Uh, I've talked to Bob Gimlin about it. I have no doubt that that film was absolutely 100% legitimate. Then you also have the famous Minnesota Iceman, which is something that not as many people know about because it was only out and about for about 10 years and then it, the guy took it off. It was the, the, the hominoid frozen in a block of ice in a floor freezer and he would take people, he would take them around, take it around in the back of, uh, of refriger refrigerated trucks and he would, you know, charge people to go see it. Wow. And I did see it when I was a young man and it was, I have absolutely no doubt. Now there's so many stories about the Minnesota Iceman because he he made he had a rubber one made up so that whenever the authorities would come harass him about having a dead body uh, he would say, it's just a rubber thing, it's just, it's not real, you know, and he would fool them, and then he would take out the real one, and I know that I saw the real one, because I, the one I saw had the blood, the wounds visible, and the, and the blood oozing out of them, so I, I don't have any doubt that I saw the real one, and I, I absolutely know what I saw, and that was a, that was a living thing, an ex-living thing in that ice, just a few inches from my face when I was about 30 years old, and had perfect eyesight, so uh, you have those two things right there. They're, they're really solid. Then you have all the great footprint evidence. And say what you will, there is a branch of science called ichnology, which is the science of studying tracks. If you see a track of an animal crawling along 
on the mud floor of a, of a river that becomes shale, and somebody then, uh, millions of years later, cracks that shell uh, that shale open, and you see that track. There are people who study that, and they can tell you the size of the thing that made the, made the track. I mean, it's really a science, and they're very, very good at it. So you can do the same thing with hominoid tracks, and you can see even in some of the best tracks, you have dermal ridges, which are your fingerprints, you know, you have your the little whirls and twirls that make up your fingerprints. You have the same thing on your feet. They're called dermal ridges. And the, some of the hominoid tracks have dermal ridges visible in them. So the tracks in any court of the law, in any court in the land, you can go to jail if you leave tracks behind of the kind that hominoids leave behind. You'd be in jail if it was, you know, if you left that kind of track behind. But in... in and when it comes to something like that, science does not allow that in as, as verifiable evidence because it's just an answer they don't want to have to deal with. It isn't that science doesn't know that these things are out there. There's enough evidence out for, for a, your average moron to understand that they're real. It's that, it's that they don't want to have to deal with the rewriting of the books and the rewriting of the dogma of the religion of science. You say what you will, science is a religion every in every sense of the word where you have to believe certain things, you have to buy into it, you have to take it on faith. And so they don't want to have their dogma upended by facts if they can avoid it, and so they'll go out of their way and work really hard to avoid it. Eventually it's going to happen. Eventually one's going to be either filmed or shot or killed in a way that it just, there's just no getting around it. Same thing with UFOs. So eventually one is going to be seen and filmed by a bunch of people at a football stadium or something. With, with the advent of cell phone cameras, it's going to happen for both hominoids and for, for UFOs. And it's just a matter of time. It okay. really is. Okay. Let's, let's continue on this, the, 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 the jigsaw of Lloyd, P- putting together your, your personal journey. Where did all of that then lead you? Like, where did you go next? Like, uh, talk to me about intervention theory. Where did that come right. the picture? Well, that I mean, that was uh, that was a real, yeah, that was a real interesting flow to that. I worked on the hominoid thing for about twenty years, and I I knew pretty pretty early into it that I was the the idea of of human evolution just wasn't working for me. I, I didn't believe that is the way we came to be here. The hominoids. It was clear to me that this planet was designed, built, and and populated with hominoids for literally millions of years, back into the time of the Miocene apes, they, who started about 25 million years ago. So if you have upright walking Miocene apes for all that time, you have them now, and that explains the hominoids in my view, but it didn't explain us. If, if we didn't evolve from higher primates, where do we come from? How do we get here? I didn't have a plausible, believable theory that I could, that I could bet on. Then someone directed me to the work of Zechariah Sitchin, and I read The Twelfth Planet in about 1990, 91, something like that. And as soon as I read that book, I realized, ah, this makes sense. This explains how humans got here in a way that I can take. He didn't have any understanding of the research I had been doing. He had nothing. He didn't know anything about hominoids. I, at that point, didn't know anything about what he had been doing. His first book came out in 76, and I didn't read it until 90, so I was just behind the curve. But once I read his stuff and I saw where he was and what he was doing, I realized I could put that I had the front end of what he was doing, and he had the back end of what I was doing, and that if I put the two things together, I could come up with something very unique and original and important. And that's what I did in Everything You Know Is Wrong, and that book uh, continues to sell very well to this day from the time I put it out in 97. But it took me, so I had to go into a lot, like five years of intense research to build the, the argument in that book and make it as plausible as it is. But, you know, it's, it's done very well over the years. And did I hear or did I read or something that you're going to redo it or update it or do another volume? Or yeah, something? I intend to as soon as I as soon as I can finish with the Star Child. My next major project will be to update everything you know is wrong. Fortunately, a lot of what's most of what's in it is stuff that just doesn't change. But yeah. there are things to add on to it, like you know the Skookum cast is another uh, thing that uh, was a big story in the world of hominoids, and it hasn't. Uh, it's not in my book because. You 
you know, it just hadn't happened when well, when briefly, I published it. Briefly, briefly, what was that? Was that this is a newer development in the last decade? Yeah, in the last decade, the Skookum cast was where it looked like a a group of people who were trying to do some filming of a Bigfoot made a mud circle and they put fruit out in the middle of it, and it looked like a Bigfoot came and laid down on its side, put its elbow down to reach and eat the fruit. But then, of course, skeptics always come along and they say, well, elk could have done it or, you know, it's so you, it, it's debatable whether or not that was actually a Bigfoot or whether it was an elk. But at first, everyone assumed it was a Bigfoot because it had all the all the physical signs of a body laying in the mud. But when you when you turn it into an elk body, well, maybe, you know, I don't know enough about elk to know. I'm just telling you that there's always going to be critics to come out to try to take down the best evidence to make sure that they, again, that they don't have to change a paradigm, that they don't have to change any of their dogma. It's like two teams that are battling it out, you know, two sport teams. There's the mainstream trying to conserve and keep what they have so that they don't, they don't have to make any big changes changes to their belief system and then there are those of us out uh, on the in the alternative world who are doing what amounts to real science which is trying to push out beyond the the envelope push out to the to the cutting edge and beyond and find new things and science just science is willing to move forward uh, you know, a quarter of an inch at a time we want to make leaps great leaps forward and that's what they don't want yeah, they they resist that, and I I love the sports imagery coming through. Your passion for sport has obviously stayed with you through the years. Oh well, yeah. Um, okay, we're starting to build a picture here, and we're coming up on the Star Child. But before I dive right into that, in the middle of all this 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 study and all this learning and all this knowledge, you were writing fiction. You did some script writing as well. You 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 were in Hollywood, and you right. did some. So you found right. time to express many different sides. Well, well, you know, you don't really make any money in this field of alternative knowledge. You ju you just don't make any money in it. So you have you do it out of love and out of passion. So you have to make you know you have to make a living as best you can. So I wrote I wrote fiction. I did. I wrote that that book about football. I wrote a spy thriller that's pretty good about um, phone freaking and computer hacking and and submarine warfare. I uh, then worked as a screenwriter in Hollywood for most of the 80s until I read the Sitchin book, and then that's when I branched off into the, the push that led me to create Everything You Know Is Wrong. So I did have a fiction career, uh, such as it was, and, and you know, just to, to make ends meet and keep body and soul of together course. and of course, do all those things. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay, so we were kind of coming up towards the end of the 90s, and we have a picture of, of who you were up to that stage and the fact that you've been doing this work and it started to become recognized within the field. And it's at this stage, if I'm correct, that uh, you were reached out to, and there was a whole other uh, chapter in your life about to begin, and it right. caught you by surprise. Uh, step yeah. back a little bit, down, <laughs> down the other road, uh, the story briefly, again, we can go through it, but uh, what exactly uh, was the history of this particular object that was about to come into your life with dramatic consequences? <laughs> Well, it was it was amazing how it happened. Really, I had spent all these years working on hominoids and and an alternative view of human origins that came out in the book Everything You Know Is Wrong, and so I hit the the lecture circuit with that. The book came out in late '97, and I hit the lecture circuit in in early '98, and I had all that one year of doing just the hominoids and the human origins, and I got very well known. Uh, just almost immediately because I went on the old Art Bell show, which was hugely popular, and people really responded to, to what I was doing. And so um, I got very well known in a hurry. And so when Ray and Melanie Young of El Paso, Texas, were given the these two skulls at the end of 98, they were members of MUFON in El Paso, Mutual UFO Network. They first tried to take the skulls to a couple of, of uh, medical specialists, you know, scientists in El Paso to see if they could explain what the star child was. And, and those specialists said, oh, it's just a cradle-boarded hydrocephalic. Don't worry about it. Just take it home and forget about it. Well, Melanie was a, uh, the, the, Melanie was a neonatal nurse for 15 years, and she knew that wasn't true. She absolutely knew those guys were wrong. 
So they went to a MUFON meeting and they said, who in the field of alternative knowledge knows or talks about skulls? That was me because of my the hominoid stuff. It, a lot of my work, my proof dealt with the comparison of prehuman skulls, all the prehuman skulls versus human skulls. You can just look at them and see what a huge, huge leap that is. And so that's that's what I would talk about. So they were told to get in touch with me, and and so they did. At that point, the irony of this is. I had not been really that interested in UFOs and aliens. I had seen a UFO when I was 28 years old, but that was it. It didn't really hey, hook me. You, you had a you yeah. saw, you saw okay. And what was the sighting like? Was, yeah. it, was it was it just something? Uh, it was at, it was at great it was a great distance. It was up and I was laying at a at a pool lounge at a pool in a lounge chair on my back on an absolutely crystal clear day in California, and I picked it up at about 90 degrees straight up over my head. I'm looking up and boom, this silver disc in a crystal clear sky, a silver, clear silver disc flies into my my vision and I track it and it's going so fast that it's about 45 degrees in a matter of a few seconds before I really realize. And I just shout out, hey, look to the guys beside me. Hey, there's a UFO. And I point up at it and by then it's almost to the horizon. About 10 seconds from high noon to over the horizon and out of sight, this thing goes. It must have been doing twenty, thirty thousand 30,000 miles an hour. I mean, it was incredible speed. And we just looked at each other. They didn't even see it. I, I just said, that was a UFO, I guarantee you. And they said, well, I didn't even see it. I said, it was just so fast you couldn't track it unless you knew what you were looking for. It was just one of those amazing. So I just said, "Wow, so a UFO," and that was really it. That, that was, was just it. Yeah, I let it go would, with that. Yeah, you let it go. You obviously were very busy with other things. So no I think a lot of people do that. Yeah. Yeah. I. I yes. Exactly. I mean, I, I. Even just socially, I meet people who've seen things over the years. Exactly the same. People get on with their lives. Okay. So you had gotten on with your lives, and now suddenly you had no great interest, and suddenly this. The 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 star child, which I I I know from I know you're not particularly fond of the name, and I don't I'm not fond of the name either. It's a very, it's too, um, it's too TV sci-fi or something like that. It's very the name itself is. Not well, it was you know it was a mistake, but there's an interesting story behind the mistake. When Ray and Melanie showed it to me, when that first of all they called me, they contacted me, they said the next time you're in El Paso, will you come by? We have something we want to show you. I said, well, what is it? And they said, we'd, we'd rather just show you. So I didn't know what it was going to be. I assumed it was going to be something to do with Bigfoot. So when I got there and found that it was these two skulls and this one skull, I knew enough about skulls to know what I was looking at. I was looking at a very unusual skull. But I, even then, I wasn't a UFO alien person. I didn't really know much about that field. And so Melanie's saying, I think it's a gray skull. I think it's a skull that goes inside the head of a gray. She knew more, a lot more about it than I did. So I said, well, I can take it and find out I can take it to some experts at this conference I'm going to and see what they say and so I was on my way to that conference so I was going to be there the next night so I said if you let me take these skulls I can let some experts look at it and they all they'll tell us what they think so that's what we did and uh, I took it to the UFO Congress got a lot of people to take a look at it and they were all saying yeah it looks like a gray it doesn't look human it looks like a gray you should really really examine it carefully we took it and got some x-rays and and had the, them extra you know the, those people look at it and they said yeah it's missing its sinuses it has no sign of frontal sinuses that's highly unusual the bone is too light uh, there are a number of things about this skull that are very unusual you ought to really pursue this and so i said okay well when i took it back to the to the uh, i mean well when it came back to the to the conference I talked to Bob and Terry Brown, who ran it, and Terry said, it's got to have a name. You can't just keep calling it the Weird Skull, because I was just calling it the Weird Skull. She said, you can't just keep calling it the Weird Skull. And so I said, well, what do you want to call it? And she said, well, did you find anything about it from the, from the x-ray? And the dental, I mean, the x-ray tech who saw the maxilla, the piece of maxilla, which is a piece of the mouth that had teeth in it, it had two teeth down that you could see, and it had five crowns five teeth buried up in the in the maxilla bone that you couldn't see but it was they were there and so he said oh well if you've got teeth down and you got teeth up that's probably a child five or six years old it's a child in the process of losing his teeth and getting new teeth so she said all right fine let's call it the star child and i said well you know we don't know what it is she said well but the people here they're gonna they need a name something they can hang their head on without thinking further down the line than that, I said, all right, let's call it a story. I'll just let it go with that. 
Well, later we found out in a child, but also later I found out that by calling it the star child, it immediately prejudiced any scientist who heard that term, yeah. that it was, we were already had made up our mind about what it was. So it's been a real problem for me. Now it's turning out to be accurate in that it is a child of the stars, even though it's an adult when it died, whatever it was, but it is from the stars, so I'm, I'm okay. I'm getting better with it now, but for a long time, I was not, I was really, it was an unfortunate yeah. choice of terminology, yeah, it really I, was. I can see that, and it does, it says so much about all of us, it says so much about people, that no matter how open-minded we, we try to be, some of us, not all of us, of course, but there is that prejudice, it's something that just, it, it's amazing, the naming of something, or the the... the, the the nickname or something, it goes to show how much we really depend on names and how much our society forms its beliefs based on the names of things, and it, it's a perfect example. Okay, so you have, you've been presented with this, and, and, and having looked, uh, for anyone who wants to go to your own website, lloydpie.com, they can have a look there at some photographs if this is new information to them. There's a variety of books out there. Um, you forward. Well, wait a minute. The, the, the one to the one to look oh. at for the Star Child is StarChildProject.com. Oh, okay. My right. personal website oh. is more to do with everything you know is wrong and the human origins and hominoids. The Star. We try to keep them separate. The okay. Star Child okay. is www.StarChildProject.com. If you go there, you'll see uh, plenty of interim free information about the Child. And again, this this weird skull, the Star Child skull. Again, on first appearance, as you got to see it first, it's visibly different to what a human skull is going to look like. So vi straight away, there, there's some apparent differences. And you felt once you started to get some tests done on it, you began to realize that it wasn't anything that could be related to, to some diseases or to some various um, uh, things that occur in nature. So at some stage you start to take the leap where you're realizing, okay, this must be not of this earth. It must be extraterrestrial. And that's kind of the progression that happened for you. That's, exa that's exactly right. It, it was at first... I really did believe it probably had to be some kind of deformity because I didn't know that much about deformity. But yeah. Melanie did. She had she had a real background in it. And she said, I'm telling you, there is no combination of deformities that I'm aware of that will make all these differences. And I said, okay, well, I'll, I'll go out and I'll try to... They had, they had their regular jobs. They had nine to five, but I was traveling around promoting my book, going all over the place, meeting all kinds of people. So I had the time and now also the interest to do it. So I said, I'll, I'll find out what it is. Well, in the course of that, what I began to find out was that no expert really knew. Experts tend to know about one thing. They tend to know about ears. They tend to know about eyes. They tend to know about brains. They tend to know about noses, mouths, whatever. But they don't know a lot about anything else. So what they would tend to say was, well, I can't explain in my particular area that I know about. I can't explain that. But I'm sure that together, all told, it's got to be some kind of deformity. Kind of what I was thinking initially, but when you added up each expert's testimony where the mouth guy can't explain, the ear guy can't explain, the eye guy can't explain, the brain guy can't explain, and you realize nobody really that knows anything about this can explain it. So by the end of the year, I had pretty much convinced myself that it probably was alien of some kind in some form or other. It certainly wasn't human. Everything about it wasn't adding up. So from the end of 99 forward, we began to focus on getting the DNA analyzed because the differences were never going to win the argument. Um, it just was even though there are literally 25 major physical differences between the star child and a normal human skull, 25 major differences, it's still not enough for science because no matter how many I would throw at them, they would just say, well, nature can do that. Nature can do anything, and we can always answer anything you say with nature can do anything, so you can't win. You can't beat us. The only way you can beat us is with DNA. Well, at that time, in 99, DNA was in its infancy compared to where it is now, and DNA really didn't help us much either. So uh, we had, we've really had to wait almost a dozen years to get into position where the technology is available to analyze 
unknown, unearthly DNA, which you can do now. So we're now we're finally in position to, to prove our point, but I've really known since the end of 99 that it wasn't going to be 100% human. I was open to the idea that it might be a human-alien hybrid, and I believed that for a long time, but now with the latest DNA result, we know that it wasn't a human-alien hybrid. It was 100% alien, both parents. Okay, and as you said, that we're now at a position where science is catching up kind of with, with your own belief. Let's take a short break at this point. We always take a break. We just play out in the stinger. Uh, stay with us on the Irish side of the moon. We are in conversation with Lloyd Pye, and we will be right back. You're listening to the Irish side of the moon. You can hear our new episodes every Monday on radiomedia.org and irishsideofthemoon.blogspot.com. You can also download episodes from iTunes, Stitcher, and many other sites. You can follow us on Twitter. You can join our Facebook group. And if you're already in the group, don't forget to invite your friends. If you have any ideas for future guests on the show, send an email to shane at the Irish side of the moon dot IE. We are Irish side of the moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. Okay, you're back with the Irish side of the moon. I'm in conversation with Lloyd Pye. Uh, we've looked a little bit at your background. We looked at uh, your interest in sport, which has stayed with you all through your life. You've managed to uh, take interest in, in, in global uh, the uh, history of our planet with regard to the different species that uh, have been on it and how we came to be here. You've stepped outside conventional, recognised, acceptable science to follow up those interests. And in the late 1990s, um, which is where we are in the story... Um, a weird skull, to use one of your phrases, uh, was uh, brought into your sphere of influence. And that has really taken over much of your energy over the last uh, tw- 12 years. And it is the main thrust of what I want to talk about for, for the remainder of our time together. So, you've mentioned it there briefly before we took the break. Uh, physically, before we even did the science, of there are 25 major physical differences between this skull with regard to, and I've got the list here because I have the um, Essentials uh, book. Uh, Shane had given it on to me. You'd obviously sent it on. So I, I've gone through this. It's really heavy going for a guy like me. It's, 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 it's so many, um, what's the expression, $10 words? But it's, it's well, <laughs> it's, 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 but looking at the list here, right? So this, this, I mean, we don't need to go through it, but I mean, before you even go into the science, um, in terms of the bone uh, being uh, half as thick as it should be in terms of it being durable, in terms of the eye sockets being unlike uh, typical eye sockets. There are 25 major reasons. And am I correct in saying that in any skull, be it down to deformity, be it down to disease, maybe one, maybe three, maybe five different things could happen and a person could continue to live. But here we have, based on the evidence with regard to the to, to, to the teeth and stuff, at the, the skull, Here's somebody who was who was living and had 25 major physical differences. It seems inc- exactly, exactly, yeah. Yeah, it seems incredible that mainstream science would st- stand firm and say that it's just nature that that they're not willing to open the door a little bit on the ideas that you're bringing to them. But that's really from day one what it's been like. You've had to uh, deal with a closed-minded. Right. Well, well, understand, though, really, and it's important that everybody understand, Michael, that it isn't that scientists aren't normal people who can understand what's in front of them. Mm. They know what it is. When I show it to them, they, their eyes pop open. They know what it is. The thing is, they have a game plan. They're a team, and they have a game plan, and they know what the game plan is, and their leaders make the game plan very clear. We do not want to deal with UFOs and aliens and, and alien life not until we absolutely have to, till it's crammed down our throat, and don't anybody out there that's on our team help in any way. Now, some people do when you get people that are older or moving toward retirement or they're running their own show and they're invulnerable to pressure or whatever. You can get you get a few now and then. It's one out of ten, one out of twenty that are willing to have that kind of courage to stand up to the peer pressure that they all know will come if they are found out to be on the side of or in any way promoting or trying to help someone prove alien reality. But it, it's just it's it's not 
from a, a passionate, for the most part, passionate disbelief or anything like that. It's just playing for their team as well as they can. That's really because it isn't that they're stupid and can't see it. They can see it. Anybody can see those differences. And as you said, if you're now remember that you have to remember that the star child lived and died 900 years ago. 900 years ago. So. Back in 1100, if you're born and you've got one thing wrong with your skull, yeah, you can make it. Maybe two things. Three things, you've got a real problem. Four things, five things, they're just going to get rid of you because they can try again very easily and, and move on from there. So if you're, if you're the product of a natural human birth 900 years ago and you look like the star child, they're not, you know, they're not going to fool with you, I don't believe. I think that's just the end of it. But because it obviously lived into adulthood before it died, that wasn't the case. It was different, but I don't believe it was a human at all. I think I think it was. I, I'm coming to think maybe it was an isolated event. Maybe a, a euphonaut crashed and and uh, lived for a while and then died or whatever. I don't know. There's there's no other skull like it that I'm aware of. So. I have to think it's kind of a one-off thing. Maybe not. Maybe others will come out over time. But most people out there that find weird skulls or pictures of weird skulls or anything, they send it to me. So I see everything, and I don't. <laughs> I haven't seen the anything like the Star Child. Um, you know, but now the Coneheads. Let's let's talk about the Coneheads for a minute. The Coneheads are indeed, in my opinion, probably an alien type as well. Now, the Coneheads are numerous. There are hundreds of them, mostly in Peru, but in other places around the world. These are the ones with the big, long, elongated skulls in the back, and they have brains that are twice the size of ours. We average about 1,400 cubic centimeters of, of brain, you and I, and an average human being, about 1,400 cubic centimeters. The Coneheads average between 28 and uh, 2,800 and 3,000 cubic centimeters. So they have twice our brain. That's not human. I don't care what you say. It can have a human face, but it's not a complete human. So we are now going to try to um, examine the DNA of some conehead samples that we've recently acquired. So we'll, you know, we'll see what comes of that. But the coneheads are really worth keeping an eye on, and, and all you have to do is uh, Google and uh, Google coneheads, and you'll, apart from the Dan Aykroyd, you know, Saturday Night Live. Stuff uh, <laughs> yes, of you'll course, of course. you'll you know, but I think that's where they might have gotten them from. One of them had taken a trip down to South America and saw them in the uh, in the museums down there, and and went from there. But anyway, so the so much, yeah, they, so much stuff out there, yeah. So much. They're stuff. very very you different. Know. The star the star child is uh, those those parts of it, and I don't think that any human born with that many differences would have been allowed to survive had it been a, a birth to a to a pair of human parents in an isolated Related rural village in Mexico at that time. I just don't see that. Okay, okay. So that's the Star Child, and we looked at the physical aspects of it. Let's, and again, this is where I really I start to sweat as I think of it. But let's look at the science of it a little bit, and let's look at some of the because at this stage, then, and going back again about a decade, at this stage, then you started to get tests run. You started to go to labs, right. and I know there was right, a, bit of a, right. a drama sometimes with that as well. You can tell us all about that. So talk to me now, getting away from the physical, the very obvious things you can see when you look at the photographs, when we look at it online, when we buy the book, the actual scientific side of it. What have you discovered on that side of things with regard to the star? Well, that's, you know, that's where it gets interesting with the DNA. In the first test in 99, it was done by a lab at the University of British Columbia that, that was not really equipped to recover ancient DNA. A DNA is divided into periods. There's ancient, which is older than 50 years, and then there's under 50 years. And the under 50 years is a lot easier to work with than the older than 50 years because there's a lot more degradation, there's a lot more bacterial contamination, and so it requires very special handling. This was a teaching lab of students. They didn't really have, they didn't have the sophistication, and it wasn't, it wasn't designed to recover ancient DNA. But in in two 
uh, I mean, in 1999, there were only six labs in the world that could even attempt to recover ancient DNA, and they would not touch something that had the name Starchild attached to it. So this lab would give it a shot. They tried. They, they thought they succeeded. They felt they succeeded. After two contaminations, they felt they got it right, but they didn't. It turned out uh, in 2003 when we got a test by a, an actual real ancient DNA lab, they found that the test in 99 was just completely wrong, all contamination, and that was it. So that, that result went out the window. The 2003 result was that there are two kinds of, of DNA in all in all the cells of your body, not all the white blood cells and the sex cells, but forget basically most of the trillions of cells in your body, they all are pretty much shaped, no matter how they're physical shaped, their design is the same. They have a nucleus, and in that nucleus is all of the nuclear DNA that comes from both of your parents, and that is the, the 23 chromosomes that your mother gives and the 23 chromosomes that your father gives, and it totals about uh, 20 to 30,000 genes, and it's 3 billion, 3 billion base pairs, nucleotides, the, the building blocks of DNA. So it's, it's a big load, and it's in the nucleus. Floating outside the nucleus in the cytoplasm of the cell, which is held in by the cell wall, it's kind of like jelly, Floating there are anywhere from hundreds to thousands of what are called mitochondria, these little bitty, bitty, bitty uh, power plants in the cells. And they have DNA as well, and it's a different kind. It's mitochondrial DNA. Now, the nuclear DNA, as I said, comes from the mother and the father, but the mitochondrial DNA comes only from the mother because it, it's, too, it's too much for sperm to carry that with it so it only comes down from the egg. So I have my mother's mitochondrial DNA, my grandmother's mitochondrial DNA, my great-grandmother, my great-great-great-grandmother right on back. And every once in a while, there will be a mutation, but not very often because in the mitochondrial DNA, this is, um, this is important to understand. There, in all of our mitochondrial DNA, in each one of those little bitty pieces of a cell, there are 10, 000, excuse me, 16,569 base pairs. 16,569 base pairs. All of it the same in all humans. It's very, very precise. Okay. Why? Be because its function is so critical. It is the power plant. You know how in the in the nuclear DNA, in the big one, in the in the nucleus, in the three billion base pairs, only it may be as much as three percent of that works, keeps us going, keeps our bodies going. I know this is incredible, yeah. but that's what the answer is. The rest of it is called non-coding. It used to be called junk DNA, but now it's called non-coding DNA because they don't really know what it does, what it's there for, but it's very well preserved by the body, so it's there for some reason, but yeah. nobody really understands at this point. Yeah, yes, with we don't the, know yet, yes, of course. Right. Well, with the mitochondrial DNA, the opposite is true. Almost all of it works and works efficiently so that if there's a mutation there where something goes wrong, then that person who has that mutation in the working, functioning part of it is not going to thrive and is probably going to die and not pass that mutation on. So mutations in the mitochondrial DNA are very rare, very rare. In fact, in all of recorded human, you know, in all of human history, according to our genes, which is about 200,000 years, we, our genes indicate that we're only about 200,000 years old as a species. In those 200,000 years, we have accumulated a maximum of 120 variations or differences in our mitochondria. In, in all 16,000 569, there are a maximum of 120 variations. So most of it is the same in all of us, okay. and the same in all of us. So, um, and, and you and I probably have 50 or 60, because the oldest of us, the, southern, the, the natives of southern Africa, have the 120, up to 120, and everybody else has less. So it, it's really not that many. And, and also, too, Neanderthals 
have about the same number, the 16,000. They have a little different number but in their mitochondrial DNA, but they have only 200 differences, only 80 more than we do. There's a new creature that was discovered last year called Denosova, or Denosovans. They were found, it, it, was, it looked like the, the skeleton of a Neanderthal in a cave in Denosova, Siberia. But when they analyzed the tip of a finger bone and then later a tooth, they found that its mitochondrial DNA had, instead of the 200 differences it should have had to be Neanderthal, 385, 185 more. So just that piece of tip of finger bone and that tooth caused them to have to create a whole new pre-human primate species, a whole new one based on that, those tests. On the test on the finger bone, they were they did it on the finger bone, and they just verified it with the tooth. Why? Because because mitochondrial DNA is so precise and it's so reliable in its reading that it's used as the clock that dates how old we are, the 200,000 years. We know as much about mitochondrial DNA as any part of human biology. We really understand this. That's what's key for the listeners to know. Okay. So yeah. with, with the, go ahead, go ahead, you have a question? No, no, no I was saying I'm, I'm agreeing with you, so I'm with you so far. So basically right. you've actually, you've painted a very clear picture, I'm going to be honest. I, I can see what's happening. You've mapped out exactly what the norm, for want of a better expression, is, and what right. we would expect to find, and why we are built up the way we are. And then as one example, you have referred over to the Din 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 am I saying that? Right, Denosova, uh, right, Denosova. Yeah, Denosova, yeah. And this was an example that was so extreme in its differences that, as you say, they created, scientifically, they had to class it as being a completely different... Different kind, system. exactly, yes, based completely. strictly on the strength of the differences in its mitochondrial DNA. And that, okay. that is all in preparation for discussing the star child's DNA. Yes, we're heading in Last direction. year... Last year, we, we found a geneticist who was willing to work with us and do some work on the, the star child using late, the latest, newest technology that is much, much more sophisticated than it was in 203. And he said, I will be able, if you have viable nuclear DNA in there, we'll be able to, to find it. Now, in 203, the result was that the human, uh, that the mitochondrial DNA of the star child, they found what they thought were traces that indicated that it was human. So we accepted that, and we accepted that the star child had to be a human-alien hybrid. Its nuclear DNA, which meant its mother and its father, they could not recover, which was a surprise, but it just meant that the father was so different that he was very likely going to turn out to be alien. They couldn't prove in 203. They just tell us that it looks like the star child's mother was human, and but its father clearly was not. But we can't we can't prove it. We don't have the ability to break uh, DNA down to its component parts, in the base pairs, the nucleotides, like that. But he, they said in three to five years that technology will come to be, and it sure enough did. So this is what we're talking about. So the new the new geneticist said, um, I think if your nuclear DNA is viable, I'll be able to recover some of it, and we'll take a look at it and see what you have. This was last year, 210. He recovered about he, dozens, several dozen fragments of the star child's nuclear DNA, fragments, that amounted to about 30,000 base pairs total, 30,000. But of the 3 billion, that is only a very small fraction. It is point zero 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 one so it's a very tiny fraction but even so that fraction when he when he sent those fragments to the NIH database in Maryland what the answer came back was some of the star child's DNA is clearly found it has corollaries in human chromosomes so part of it is human like didn't doesn't mean that it's human it's just human like okay. and and part of it is not found in the database, meaning it's not found on Earth. It's it's so unusual that it's not found in the database. So we really had hit a home run back in 210 with it. But when you when you would 
talk about it to experts, they'd say, well, it's just too small a sample, and any number of things could have gone wrong, and da 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 and we just don't buy it and can't accept it, and uh, you know, all of that. They're going to force us to recover the whole genome. That's just their game, that we understand what it is. Everything that we come up with that's a partial is going to be discounted, even though it's very clear that when the NIH couldn't find parts of it that we had really done something amazing with it. So then the geneticist went back. Now understand that when he recovers these fragments, it's just random. You don't know where you're going to get them from. So all of the ones he recovered came from the non-working parts. So he couldn't, he couldn't find any proteins or anything that worked, so there was just nothing to do. But then he recovered four fragments that came from the mitochondria. Now, this was much bigger news because instead of it being the 3 billion, it's yeah. only 16,000. You see what I mean? Yes, 16,569. It's much yes. smaller and much more compact yeah. and much easier to work with. So those four fragments taken together amounted to like 1,583, I think it was, base pairs total. So that's that's nine and a half percent, almost ten percent of the the whole mitochondrial DNA. So that's we're lot. sitting that's now, a... yeah, we're sitting now with possession of almost ten percent of the star child's mitochondrial DNA. When in fact, statistically, one percent is all you need to have a be able to make really good projections for the whole thing. One percent is all you need. We, in, in the nuclear DNA, we had 0. .0001. It wasn't really enough. Well, now, with this, we've got way over 1%. We've got almost 10%. When those, when those differences in the star child are counted up, it, well, when the, when the differences of that many for a human are counted up, 10%, a, it would have a maximum of 12 on average, if you see what I'm saying. If you, you know, if you extrapolate 10%, since humans may have a maximum of 120, 10% is 12. So that would be 12 in the human same stretch of those four, um, of those four fragments. With the star child, there are 93 differences, 93 differences as recorded by the machines. Now, that means if you extrapolate that, multiply by 10, you yeah. get 930. So where you have, just imagine yourself with a graph line, and you have 120 for a human maximum. This is 15,000. You just imagine a line that's 15,000 units. It's 569 lines, you know, units long, and you have the differences for a human are 120. A little further down, you have a Neanderthal at 200. Yep. A little further down from that, you have a Denosova at 385, yep. way, way down the line, you have a chimp at 1,500. 1,500 differences as opposed to 120 differences for a human. So you got a human, and then you have 1,500 for a chimp and gorillas even more, of course, and rats and mice, and you know, it goes on down there. Yes. Sitting, at, sitting at the between, somewhere between 800 and 1,000, is going to be the star child's final mitochondrial DNA count. Some of those 93, the machines could have made mistakes. They sometimes do make mistakes. But let's just say it's, it's 80 are going to yeah. prove out to be. It's 800. Yeah. So I'm saying between yeah. 800 and 1,000, there sits the star child. So by itself, by just, just when they recover its mitochondrial DNA, the whole genome, it's going to be a new species, just like Denosova was, at a minimum. It is a new, entirely new species. But the question then becomes, well, what kind of species? What can you call it if it's not, if it's not close to Neanderthal, if it's not close to Denosova, the prehumans? It, can you call it an alien? Well, obviously, yes, you can. It, it has got to be considered an alien if it's that far away, but it's also midway between a chimp. So it's not a chimp. It's not, it's not a higher primate. It is something standing alone by itself and so very, very different that you can't really call it anything but an alien. So we have now 
enough that if, if it was anything other than this issue, this contentious, uh, highly argumentative issue of, of, alien, of alien reality, we could take this to, to mainstream media and they would be jumping all over it. But they run from it, they stay away from it, and we don't really push it out there because we understand that we can't, we can't make these claims until we have the whole genome, all three billion base pairs, which includes the mitochondrial genome, until we have it all laid out there so that science really has no room to argue. They, ju they just have no room to argue once we have the whole thing. When we get it to that point, we win, but we will not win until we get it to that point. So now our job is to raise the money, and that's what we're trying to do, to raise the money to do the recovery of the genome and, and filming it and uh, turning that into documentaries to, to pay back the investment because it's, it's quite an investment that has to be made, um, several million dollars. But for whoever does it, you know, they're going to be a part of history. This is a very, very big deal brewing. And that's what you've done. You've put together a team. You've put together a documentary team. You've, you've enlisted, I think, a producer from England, if I'm correct. And you're, this is part of raising sufficient funds to get to the finish line, because now you can see the finish line. Right, you, you exactly. Because it's all happening we have, now. We have everything, right, we have everything in place now except the, the money. We have our director. We have our distributor. We have our attorney. We have our accountant. We have our film commission behind us. We have everything that we need to do this, to carry it through. We have, of course, our geneticists and our laboratory, big, big laboratory and, and well-known um, geneticists. We've got everything we need except the money, and now we're in the in the part now where we do that, but we couldn't really go after the money. We went after the other people based on the strength of the point zero zero one, but that really wasn't enough to to get the money. The the, the almost ten percent, the nine point five percent of the mitochondria that should be enough. Uh, anybody with real money. Uh, should be able to understand that we're going to be able to make history with this on a scale of landing people on the moon. So the, as we get it out there and get it in front of investors, I think we'll we'll be successful with that. I'm, I'm really not too worried about it. It's yeah, hard work, but it, we can do it. And that's the stage you're at now, and that really brings you full circle in terms of bringing you up to date. This is what you're doing now. You're trying to generate the interest in the investment-based community and get people on board and then it's just in the classic uh, screenwriter sense, it's to be continued, it's uh, tune in. And like, can you project, I mean, here's a difficult question, uh, assuming everything falls into place very well, what's your time frame? I mean, what... what yeah, we have that pretty well worked out from the time. If we can get the investment secured in the next, say, se you know, several weeks or a couple months, which we think it, from, from now, that would be a reasonable time frame, you know, we're, to, to actually have the money in hand. They all have to go through their due diligence and check everything out and do all that. But let's just say we have the money at the beginning of, say, August or September. Okay. The, the geneticists start their work, and they, have, they are able to recover the genome, the full genome, in about three to four months. Uh, at three to four months. It sound, you can look at that as it's pretty long. I look at it as it's amazingly fast compared to how it used to be. But nonetheless, three to four months, they have the, the recovery of the genome. But that is not the sequencing of it. That is not the explaining of the unusual parts of it. We know going in that a very big chunk of the star child uh, genome is never going to have been seen before, so there there's not going to be any frame of reference for it. That's going to have to be established by hand by people who specialize in doing that kind of work. So that's going to require an additional maybe year to eight, 18 months, depending on how much of it. Let's say 10% of it has never been seen before and all that, maybe six months. But they're expecting it to be out in the range of 20 to 30%, maybe more, um, as much as 50% never seen before. And that would be the full probably 18 months to, to figure all that out. But once it's done, once those two years or year to year to two years is complete, then we're able to lay it down base pair by base pair, nucleotide by nucleotide, against a human, against a Neanderthal, against a Nosova, against a, a, a chimp, against a gorilla, against anything you want to lay it down against. 
and see how different it is and where those differences are. And that's the point where we feel that anybody of any reason is going to have to say, yeah, this is, this is alien. This is the, the, so much of this is not really found on Earth. There's no way to say that it's from Earth. So that's what we're expecting. So we think the first documentary film that we want to make, we want to make two documentary films. We think the first one will be out about a year after the, the uh, investment is made and the, and the lab can start. About a year later, the first documentary should be hitting theaters. And then about a year after that, the second documentary should be hitting theaters. So that's how it, that's how it seems right now. Excellent. It really is a story, a huge story, that's unfolding as we watch. I mean, we watch from the sidelines, you're in the thick of it. Um, before we bring our conversation to an end, there's a couple of other uh, questions. I want to turn focus uh, away for a moment uh, from, from the Star Child and talk to you about yourself a little bit. There's a couple of things that we like to ask all of our guests and certainly, uh, certainly very relevant to yourself. Over the last decade and a bit of small change, you have faced so much criticism. And I know that there is uh, so much... I know that you, on your own website you make references to Wikipedia and trying to set the record straight and trying to clear up a lot of... In a position such as that, where day after day almost you feel like you're you know, fighting against the, 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 the tide... Um, Briefly, how do you do it? How do you get up in the morning? I mean, do you ever do you ever just pull the covers up and say, "Look, I'm not doing it today"? <laughs> like, well, you know, you you it, it's uh, uh, the answer that I always give when when people ask me that is, we we have a saying in the South when somebody's a little bit dinged in the head, they're not quite right. You know, we say that boy ain't right. <laughs> you know, the Cajuns have a way of saying it. <laughs> That, that boy ain't right. So that, you know they're not right in the head. And I think all you can say about me is that that boy ain't right. <laughs> you know I don't, I don't know. It, it it takes a very unusual personality to be able to just look at something and know that it's right and just not care what anybody else says and just move ahead because I know this is right and I've known it since '99. So I just look at all of those critics out there and those people that say all those stupid things that they say about it based on just the worst kind of gross misinterpretation of the data and just wrong data, and, and they just live and die on it. Uh, I just All I think is someday they're going to all have to eat crow in their own way, and I, I know that none of them will ever you know apologize or anything like that. That's not what they do. No. But it's just that our turn is going to come to win, no matter how it seems, no matter how many points we seem that we're behind, we know that in the end we're going to hit the bomb and we're going to we're going to score the final points and we're going to win. So when you know that, when you know that you're going to win in the end, it does give you a kind of strength and motivation to keep going and yeah, it's very annoying to have all the 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 wikipedia particularly because people, when they hear about this, the first thing they do is they go to Wikipedia and they read all that garbage, and they don't have any understanding that Wikipedia is a tool of the mainstream. It's controlled by the mainstream. There's nobody in the alternative world that has anything at all to do with Wikipedia, so any alternative subject is going to be trashed wide open, and people don't really understand because in many other areas, Wikipedia is very reliable, but when it comes to alternative material, they're completely yeah. corrupt, just completely corrupt. So uh, you can't change them. I mean, I invite anybody listening, go on to the Star Child website, Try to make any kind of a positive change on it, and within a matter of a few hours, and we've done this hundreds of times, so don't really waste your time. There is somebody who's in charge of my personal website and in charge of the Wikipedia, the Star Child website, and those people are notified when any changes are made to our pages, yeah. and within a matter of a few hours, they change it back. That's just the way it works. Yeah, yeah, I know, I know. Uh, frustrating, but your attitude, I think, is a good one because you you say yourself when you know that you are justified in your cause, and when you feel, even though you may never get uh, apologies or anything from people, when you know that you can win and will win out in the end, 
it keeps you going and I suppose keeps you sane. I wonder are you stubborn? Are you stubborn? Do you do you are you the guy who, who Yeah. Who, yeah, okay. <laughs> that yeah. helps that helps yeah. as well. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I, I have to plead guilty to that one. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> I'm pretty stubborn. Well, you know, the football book you talked about earlier um, that is based on my experiences playing football in college, and, and that stubbornness got me into some, some trouble when I was there, um, <laughs> difficulty with coaches and things. But, you know, yeah, so I've had that kind of since I was a kid. Um, I just, you know, if I believe I'm right about something, I, I am very, very dogged, and I yeah. will just stick with it and just I have that that personality and that trait. And I don't think you can do this kind of work without that. I mean, I really don't. I don't think you can. Because if you, the weight of the disapproval and the weight of the criticism will overcome you if you don't have a really, really strong, solid sense of yourself and that you're you're doing a good thing and a right thing that's going to, in the end, pan out. Uh, I don't see how you could do it. Right. Last uh, question again. I always love to ask people like yourself who are accomplishing these sort of things, and, and I know our listeners from the feedback really like to hear it. But with with the nitty gritty, the day to day work methods. I mean, in terms of getting your own self focused, because you're lecturing, you're traveling, you're writing, you're organizing tests and collating data. You're um, uh, you know, on the how, and then you have to organize people, and you obviously have a team working with you, and even put together a production team. How do you motivate people? How do you get speakers, or uh, not speakers, when you're speaking, how do you get the audience motivated and interested? How do you get team members when you're, you know, getting somebody who's coming on board maybe to make a documentary and finding the right person for that? The listener listening well, to this, uh, what tips can you give somebody who wants to get out there and do something themselves, maybe about this or maybe about something else? What advice would you give someone like most that? People, most people that end up on the team... Really, honestly, Michael, uh, people that got in touch with me for one reason or another and just said, look, I want to be in. Here's what I can do. I don't care what. You don't have to pay me anything. I just want in on this because I can I can tell this is going to be a big deal. And that's kind of how everybody is, uh, you know, the, the key players have have come on board. I mean, Matt Richards, the director, that he got in touch with me that way. He says, I don't care what. I just want to be in on it. Uh, I believe in it. I've read it all. I'm I'm wired up and I'm convinced and and just, you know, get, work me in. And uh the geneticist the same way. He he contacted me. He said, "You know, when I first heard about you, I thought it was a complete crock, but then a, my one of my wife's best friends re- heard heard you and read your book and she he she convinced my wife to read them and my wife did and and my wife convinced me, and now I'm convinced that you might really have something. And so, you know, it's it's kind of like that. People have to be sort of already won over to the cause. You can't just go in. Like we're seeing it right now trying to get investors. Most people with money already think they know pretty much everything they need to know about anything, particularly about their areas of expertise that have allowed them to make their money. So when you come at them with something like this where all they've ever been told is that this stuff is, you know, hoaxes and frauds and it's not something that they can believe in, it's very, very hard for it's not so much hard to find people with money. It's hard to find people with money who have open minds to new areas of information and particularly information that conflicts with what they've been brainwashed to believe already. So that's what really makes it hard is finding the those who who already have an inclination toward doing what we're doing who have the money and they're, and they're just I don't know where they are. I haven't found anybody yet, but we're working to find that as we move move along. As you move forward. Um, I think that really brings us to the end of our conversation for today. In many respects, uh, probably the best part of the story is ahead of you. The best part is to come. And uh, I, I agree. Uh, That's a very good yeah. observation. Yeah, yeah probably the, so. I mean, that's not saying that this this hasn't been a great story because it really is a great story. You've got the the intrigue, the action, and the epic scope 
uh, that something like this can truly, can truly provide. Right. Um, right. Great to have you. I know that you have a busy day ahead of you. So again, thank you so much for making. Thank, it. thank you for having me. And oh, and for those you. who want to learn more, the e the the website StarchildProject.com has plenty of information. The ebook, which is very inexpensive, has it boiled down into a very tight little package that's easy to access and acquire. Lots of pictures, lots of yeah. illustrations. Michael can vouch for that. Yeah, and it's just you know. Educate yourself. That's the best thing you can do for us to help us is just educate yourself so that you can talk about it intelligently and maybe convince some of your friends to take a look. And, you know, we, that's how we build the base. Lloyd, thank you very much. Wishing you everything. Thanks, best. Michael, very, very much for having me. Bye-bye. And that gentleman was Lloyd Pye. Pleasure to speak to him. Star Child Project. Again, no dots, no hyphens, no underscores or nothing starchildproject.com will uh, allow you to check out uh, everything we've been talking about in that conversation um, if it's new to you if it's not new to you check it out and Lloyd's own site lloydpie.com is also well worth checking out uh, we'd very much like to get that gentleman back on the show uh, to talk about uh, pre-1999 talk about uh, his other work also of great interest uh, to I'm sure to many of our uh, to many of our listeners uh, hopefully uh um, yeah, we'll set that up, get Shane to work on that for some other, uh, from later season of Irish Side of the Moon. Uh, so this was Irish Side of the Moon number 78. Uh, you can check out our archive at irishsideofthemoon.blogspot.com. You can find us and other listeners on uh, Facebook, facebook.com, Irish Side of the Moon. And uh, lots of people posting and communicating there. You can find us on iTunes and various other locations. Uh, if you want to get in touch, uh, Michael at the Irish side of the moon dot IE or Shane at the Irish side of the moon dot IE are the uh, best avenues of communication. Contact Shane with maybe ideas for guests, or if you want to come on the show yourself, you can tell us why. And for myself, Michael, if you are um, interested in um, local radio or getting involved with us or radio stations around the world, in your part of the world, I mean, uh, we are actively reaching out to stations and uh, it's possible you're listening on one of those right now. Uh, if you uh, want to communicate about that, uh, you can get in touch with myself. Okay, let's take a quick rundown uh, as is customary at the end of the show. Let's take a look down through some of the postings on that Facebook page. Uh, where are we going? Right, let's start with the Germany's top court. This one's on euobserver.com. Uh, Germany's top court to examine Greek bailout. Briefly looking at the opening paragraphs here. While the EU EU's struggles to deal with debt-ridden Greece has been a drama played out in Brussels and in Athens, a new front will open up when Germany's top judges consider whether last year's bailout was legal. The Constitutional Court will begin hearing arguments in three cases challenging Germany's role in the Greek bailout and the Euro Area Rescue Fund last year. Any decisions will only be taken in a few weeks, but the judges could ultimately find that Germany's participation went against the Constitution. Around 50 complaints about the bailout have been lodged with the court, the vast majority have been rejected, with 15 remaining of these 15, three are now being formally heard. Uh, the main argument this time is that the aid has breached the EU's treaty, EU treaties no bailout clause. And that story continues. That's on euobserver.com. We link uh, put up on our own uh, Facebook to that particular story. And Siobhan had uh, clicked there, res responded, liked that particular one. Uh, moving back down the page, uh, the war on terror, yeah, or costs of war, rather, I suppose the best way to cost of war dot org is the website. Uh, cost of war dot org. Uh, again, just going to read the opening of this. This is a good, uh, good website. If, if yeah, the president of the United States has told the American people and the rest of the world that even as the U.S withdraws some troops from Afghanistan and continues to withdraw from Iraq, the wars will continue for some years. The debate over why each war has was begun and whether either or both 
should have been fought continues. What we do know, without debate, is that the wars begun 10 years ago have been tremendously painful for millions of people in Afghanistan, Iraq and Pakistan and the United States and economically costly as well. Each additional month and year of war will add to that toll. To date, however, there has been no comprehensive accounting of the costs of the United States wars in Afghanistan, Iraq and Pakistan. The goal of the Costs of War project has been to outline a broad understanding of the domestic and international costs and consequences of those wars. The Eisenhower Research Project based at Brown University assembled a team that includes economists, anthropologists, political scientists, legal experts and a physician to do this analysis. And the five bullet points uh, given next constitute what they asked. What have been the war's costs in human and economic terms? How have these wars changed the social and political landscape of the United States and the countries where the wars have been waged? What will be the long-term legacy of these conflicts for veterans? What is the long-term economic effect of these wars likely to be? Were and are there alternative, less costly and more effective ways to prevent further terror attacks? That's costofwar.org and uh, again, an um, amazing amount of information there. Uh, all the uh, drop-down menus across the top of that particular, uh, that particular website. Okay, going back, uh, the next thing we have is, yes, documentary, um, YouTube link, John and who else, a few other people responding to that, William, Tina, Robin, Lisa, uh, this one's uh, DMT, the spirit molecule, and again, as I say, a documentary, uh, a link to that on YouTube, uh, the mysteries of consciousness, yes, uh, again, this will be coming up, or will be referenced probably in an upcoming show. It's part of research for a show. Um, Mysteries of Consciousness. Uh, basically, again, just reading briefly from the top of it here, it's on explorejournalblog.wordpress.com. Explorejournalblog.wordpress.com. Uh, on October 12, 1994, a 10 year old girl in Manchester, England, complained of a headache. When it subsided, she started writing letters and numbers upside down and backwards. Although Vicky, the girl, could read what she wrote perfectly well, nobody else could, which caused her to cry in the classroom from frustration, etc. Several experts evaluated her. None of them could make uh, a diagnosis. Over the next 11 months, uh, Vicky's handwriting got worse, eventually degenerating into illegible lines and squiggles. And the story goes on to explain that uh, on the 27th of September 1995, almost a year later, uh, she banged her head while uh, watching some sport on TV. And the next day she could read and write properly again. Uh, again, the story goes on to talk about consciousness. Uh, yeah, that's explorejournalblog.wordpress.com. Uh, for that particular story going back down again uh, again a couple of responses to that as well uh, cheer and sir Tracy Adam Julie Adrian uh, Mandy putting a humorous comment there underneath that as well um, uh, documentary a link what is it the amazing intelligence of crows okie dokie there you go uh, worth checking out I'm sure Greenpeace, Monsanto. Yeah, here's another story from earlier in the week um, from theecologist.org. Theecologist.org. Greenpeace takes on Monsanto over pesticides arms race. And again, just briefly looking at the opening of this particular story. Main ingredient of Monsanto's Roundup weed killer is being linked to cancer, birth defects and Parkinson's disease and should be banned according to campaigners behind new report. Uh, the use of the popular weed killer Roundup in public parks and, agri uh, and on agricultural crops is a danger to public health, according to a new analysis of scientific evidence. One of the main ingredients of Roundup, 
as well as several other herbicides, is a particular chemical. And a review of academic research conducted by Greenpeace and the anti-GM campaign group GN Freeze suggests that exposure to this chemical can cause cancer, hormonal imbalance, birth defects and neurological illnesses, including Parkinson's. And that story goes on in greater detail. And that's on the ecologist.org link from our own uh, Facebook page there. And uh, a lot of responses to that. Nicole, William, Tiernus Aragon, uh, Mercy, Paul, Ku Cullen, love that name, uh, Marcia, Stuart, Elaine, um, Dan, Michaela. Again, yeah, a lot of responses to that particular one uh, on our own Facebook there. Uh, what else? EU states. Okay, right. Transparency. Yes. Um, this one. Uh, EU states. This is on eobserver.com. Again, EU states appeal court ruling on transparency. And this echoes back to some of our very early shows uh, when we spoke to Jan's Peter Bondi. Um, EU member states are set to launch an appeal of a lower court decision with the European Court of Justice hoping to prevent greater transparency in decision making, even about transparency rules themselves. Anxious that a recent landmark court ruling could radically open up to public scrutiny, decision making in the Council of Ministers, the European Union's upper house, or the institution representing the member states, a full 20 EU countries have jumped aboard an appeal of the decision. According to EU law, the result of all legislative votes in the Council must be made public. But long before this stage of the process, most of the real negotiations happen at a working group level, and the secrecy of positions at this stage are jealousy, jealously guarded by all those involved. Uh, earlier this year, Access Info, a Spanish transparency uh, NGO, that aids journalists and citizens in making freedom of information requests across Europe, got wind that some member states in a council working group in late 2008 had proposed amendments to water down the existing uh, EU transparency rules. Their request for the document naming the countries uh, pushing in this direction was effectively denied. Uh, it was released, but with all the countries' names blacked out. Uh, and the group appealed the decision with the EU General Court in Luxembourg. The UK and Greece intervened in the case, arguing against greater openness. And that story goes on and on and on. Um, uh, yeah, the comment is superfluous, really. Sadly, superfluous. And below that, uh, a couple of more stories. Dissidentvoice.org. Uh, story there and below that corpwatch.org uh, another story linked which brings us more or less back to last week uh, that's a week's worth of activity on our Facebook page responses from people again encouraging people to respond encouraging people to post your own relevant uh, um, stories and, uh, and we, uh, have them seen by the community I suppose is what I'm trying to say and uh, share on the links that you see there indeed this goes for the shows as well if you think it's worthwhile if you think it's worth sharing then please consider sharing it on spread the message uh, spread the messages of our guests okay uh, I think that's everything crossed off the to-do list for the end of this week's show again uh, I'm not sure on timing here but if you're listening to the downloaded podcast this is the end of the show and thank you for your time. If you're listening on a radio station, there's probably some of our archive material coming up in just a moment to bring us to the top of the hour. In either case, thank you for spending some of your time with the Irish Side of the Moon. We appreciate it. And please consider coming back for more at a later date. We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. I still have a dream. Dream, 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 dream. This is just a ride. ride, ride, ride. We can change it anytime we want. It's all in a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. A choice right now between fear and love. Love, love. Freedom of information, personal empowerment, the Irish side of the moon.